There are several challenges implementing content security policy. First of all, content security policy is a collection of security policies. It's not a single entity. So like any complex framework, there's a significant learning curve that goes along with learning the skill and applying the skill. Also, content security policy works by detecting differences between code that comes with the application written by the developer and code that's been injected during the runtime of the application. So the application is running in the browser, some combination of HTML, styles, JavaScript, and so on. And the idea is that the browser understands this baseline. It knows, quote, what the application looks like. When malicious code is injected while the application is running, content security policy is supposed to kick in, realize that there's now this difference between the baseline and the new document object model or the new application runtime. And it's able to block the injection because it realizes a line has been crossed. But applications have to establish this baseline by writing best practice code that allows the browser to baseline the code. And this takes discipline. And for some development teams, it may be a different way of coding applications than what they're used to. So it's a change. And with any change, there's difficulties in switching to the new way. Also, it's technically possible for teams to implement the content security policy header, but simply turn off the content security policy by allowing unsafe modes intended for backwards compatibility. So a project might contain the content security policy header, technically speaking, but not actually implement content security policy. And for some naive scanners that are simply looking to see if the header exists or not, this can be enough to sneak past those lower fidelity scanners. Now, a better scanner would actually look at the context of the policy and reason through whether or not these unsafe directives are included. To start with, this is a big change for developers. JavaScript technically can be written either by including the JavaScript and in include files or by writing the JavaScript in line. So let's take a look at two examples of this. In Matilda, we're going to go to the content security policy page. There's a version of this page that doesn't have content security policy, and in fact is intentionally left in kind of the old style way of developing pages. So if we look at the code behind this page, what we'll notice is, is that some of the scripts and some of the styles are linked from style sheets and JavaScript files respectively. But as you look through the code, what you'll notice is, is that there are places where there's also styles and JavaScript that's not coming from include files, but in fact is inline. So as an example, right here is a style that centers this table data element. And it's not included from a separate file, but in fact just written right into the HTML directly. You might think of this as the application is injecting a style in the middle of HTML. So that doesn't allow the browser to baseline the web page. A little bit higher on this page, we see a script. And this script is also inline. So there's HTML that comes down the page. And then we reach a point where suddenly some JavaScript is embedded. And then 
at the end of the script, the page picks up again with more HTML. This kind of context switching doesn't allow the browser to baseline, and it makes it difficult for it to tell whether the JavaScript was included in line with the page or whether the JavaScript was injected with the page. So content security policy forces us to write best practice code. All of our JavaScript, all of our styles has to be put into the corresponding include page. That's going to be the .js for JavaScript and the .css for the style sheets. When it comes to the styles, just like inline JavaScript, these things tend to be everywhere in legacy applications. And it makes it very difficult to take an existing application that wasn't built with content security policy in mind and transform it into one that's ready for CSP. It's not difficult if you're writing an application for the first time to just choose to write the styles inside of a CSS page and then include them later. But the biggest problem is going to be with existing applications. This also includes events. And for quite a while, a lot of developers are used to putting JavaScript events in line. You'll see these so-called on events everywhere, on submit, on load, on mouse over, and so on and so forth. Even these events cannot be in line in order to take full advantage of CSP. The events have to be offloaded and they are added at using event listener methods. So it's not difficult to do, but the problem is, is again, is the existing applications and trying to port all of those on events over into an event listener. Now there is some relief. It's, there's two different ways that we can mark code that was intentionally put on the page by developers so that the browser knows in advance that that code belongs to the development team and it wasn't injected at runtime by some other source, some untrusted source. So we can basically tag the good code and presumably if any kind of evil code was introduced then the browser would notice that the evil code wasn't tagged or wasn't carrying the right tag and would be able to put a stop to it. One of the methods is seen here on the screen where we can use a nonce, a number used once, to mark the good code and to keep it from getting blocked. There's also another method where we can take a digest or a hash of the code and include the hash. In this next part, I'll take a look at implementing content security policy.